Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our Improvement Enabled by Technology journey. I'm delighted to lead this session where you're, you're going to hear from teams across England as part of our National Innovation Collaborative to support patients at home using digital technology. You'll hear from frontline teams about the fabulous work they've been doing in unprecedented times. I'm Breed O'Brien and I lead a team in NHSX focusing on technology-enabled remote monitoring. Our role as a national organisation is to drive digital transformation across the NHS and, NHS and care sector in England. I'm a nurse by background and an improver at heart. This really is about improvement enabled by technology and I'm delighted to see this featuring more prominently in the forum this year. I believe aligning the efforts in our digital and improvement worlds more closely provides us with an amazing opportunity to really make a difference for our patients and citizens. It's been a rapid journey for us this year, from testing a concept in wave one to a national spread to 90 organisations by the year end of a technology-enabled remote monitoring service for patients with COVID. You'll hear some examples later, including our first acute site. And if you're interested in this topic, Dr. Matt and Kim outlined the work of the National Clinical Model on this in the session C2 on Wednesday. Alongside the COVID-specific work, teams have been working on technology-enabled remote monitoring more generally, focusing areas, fo the areas we focused on are on the slide, with uh, last count 78,000 patients supported in this way. Uh, this is all about partnerships with patients to enable them to self-care knowing that they're supported by clinical teams in the background. It's about using digital tools to enable care to be delivered safely in the patient's home. We need to make no assumptions about who it's suitable for. That needs to be a decision made by each patient with the patient and the clinician. As I said earlier, we have 90 teams across the country offering tech-enabled COVID services. This map shows the other 24 areas of focus, all determined by local teams a real focus on long-term condition support, and we were delighted to see working care homes featuring everywhere, as this was such a vulnerable group during COVID. Our role, in, in our role as an innovation collaborative and an NHSX national role is to help build a learning system that supports regions and local systems teams to, um, to thrive. We facilitate engagement and connect like-minded people working on similar initi initiatives and we're delighted to be working in partnership with our national AHSN network to deliver this. Uh, this just shows some stats on levels of engagement. We've got growing membership of our online collaboration space, which is open to health and care staff across England. A real focus on patient and staff stories, and I'm delighted one of our, we will pop later in the chat, a podcast that's been released today, which is a nurse and a patient talking about what this means to both of them. We're helping, to, this is to help and create create and maintain the energy for change, which is featured a lot in the conference. And my last slide is what it's all about. This is about some patient feedback. We've got lots of patient feedback. This is a small selection. I particularly like the last two sentences, which I've highlighted. It was like having them in the room with you, at your side. I never felt I was on my own. This is really important because these were patients with COVID who are probably incredibly scared. So we can achieve this if we do it the right way. Uh, there's also growing evidence that patients can effectively be cared for these across numerous models of care, and you'll hear more on this later. The format for today is a rapid tour of England with two sessions of rapid fire presentations, each followed by a Q&A. We want this to be a, uh, an interactive session, so please get engaged in the chat and we will pop uh, you know, social media, uh, Twitter handles, etc., so we can keep the conversation going. Uh, but the teams will, let me, will join us to respond to, uh, to the Q&A. It's the start of a conversation. Uh, now we're going to hear from the first four teams, starting with the important focus on inclusive digital transformation. I'm delighted to introduce Roz Davis. Uh, she's the Managing Director of M Habitat to kick us off and tell her story. Roz, over to you. Thank you, Breed. Um, and as we just said, um, I work for M Habitat and we are a multidisciplinary team of designers and researchers and engagement specialists. And we're hosted by Leeds and York Partnership Foundation Trust. Um, and I'm going to share to, with you today a brief summary of our inclusive digital transformation programme. And I have actually stuffed the slides full of more than I can talk about today, but I hope they will provide you with a useful takeaway. And please do get in touch if you want to find out more. So 
as we are aware, all, um, the pandemic was a, a catalyst for the rapid digital transformation of health and care, but the unintended consequences were the triple whammy of pre-existing inequalities exacerbated by COVID-19 and by digital exclusion. And the people most affected by these inequalities are most likely to need health and care services. So in response to this, we embarked on a journey of discovery to understand how we might embed inclusion upfront into digital transformation. And the remote monitoring programme led by NHSX was one of the early projects that we connected with. Um, we joined in close to home in the, in the North East and Yorkshire, where we hooked up with the regional NHS England team and the academic health science networks. And we ran co-design sessions focused on two digital tools, Taito Care and a live call. Um, alongside that, we, uh, did, we delivered a regional learning programme for 30 clinicians and technicians and other people working in digital transformation. And we developed a repository to share good practice and useful tools and guides and so on. And through this, and at the end of that discovery journey, we developed a framework for what we know so far, really, about what good inclusive tr good, uh, transformation looks like. So um, we learned that the risk factors... Oh, we looked at the risk factors um, which create barriers for people um, to benefiting from digitally enabled health and care are multi-layered, they're complex and they change over time. And they include life context, uh, for example, where you live, what's happening in your life, your income, uh, the conditions that you live with and so on. And they can all create quite a complex picture. Um, but also the more well-known well uh, risk factor around digital skills, confidence and motivation, and really importantly, the system side of things, so the accessibility of tools and the skills and confidence of staff. And it's clear to overcome these barriers, we need to join forces and pool resources across sectors. So whether that be the, um, the voluntary sector, local government, academia and the private sector, they all have a part to play. So as I mentioned, we ran co-design sessions with clinicians, care workers and patients in relation to two digital tools to test both um, inclusive and non-inclusive factors. Our title care is an all singing, all dancing, vital signs monitoring um, tool and a live call, a finger pad ECG monitoring tool. And I think these are two potential real game changing pieces of kit. And both pieces of kit in this circumstance were being handled by health and care workers in people's homes. So uh, they would collect monitoring information and then it could be accessed um, remotely by a consultant or a GP. So obviously the digital skills required in both cases were related to staff, not patients. But we discovered that life context can still be, in some cases, an excluding factor. So um, in Taito care, for example, it's not always appropriate for people living with paranoia. And for a live call, there are physical and cultural and potential learning disabilities that can um, have, have a relation to exclusion factors. So we also learned that internet connections are not always easy to access in care homes um, and it can be due to, due to um, patchy broadband and GPs don't always have the, the right devices to, to receive the information. And we also, uh, while we were there, learned a few things uh, about um, the potential issues around flow of information, um, which we think could be used to improve the process. So for, for example, having clear policies about who interprets the data, easy read information to help prepare patients and training care workers to build their skills and confidence before we actually get into implementation. So our overarching conclusion was that these two pieces of kit were pretty inclusive and actually they could be used to reduce inequalities and increase access and very importantly I think improve the experience of care for some of our most vulnerable people. So that was a whistle stop tour and as I mentioned we carried out a number of different projects last year with a number of different partners and, and parts of the system and we pulled together this starter to for 10, for 10 on what we think so far what inclusive uh, digital transformation looks like and we did this because we want to help people who are interested people organizations and systems along their own inclusive digital transformation journey so I hope this will be useful to some of you here today and thank you very much for listening and I'll hand back to Breed. Thanks, Jay. And now to the uh, Northwest and Jay Hamilton. Jay is the Associate Director for Health Innovation Manchester, one of our AHSNs, and their project implements a COVID-19 tracker to care homes, a great example of partnership working. Jay? Hi, thanks, Breed. Um, my name's Jay Hamilton. I'm an Associate Director at Health Innovation Manchester in the Northwest of England. And I'm here today to talk to you about our digital COVID-19 tracker that we placed into care homes during the COVID pandemic. 
Okay, so um, probably the best place to start is with the aim of the project. The aim of the project was really simple. We were trying to improve the way that carers, often non-clinically trained, could track symptoms of COVID-19 during this horrendous time uh, of, of pressure and, and turmoil within the care home sector with this very vulnerable group of patients, uh, residents as, uh, as, we, as we describe them. We wanted to be able to track that in a daily, timely manner using technology that was simple to use, but created consistent, high quality communication tools to uh, awaiting clinical teams should we need to escalate care or intervene with any, uh, any clinical advice to the care home during a time where it was really important to keep the uh, to keep the care homes as free from people coming in and out unless absolutely necessary. So that was the overall aim of this program. We included a few other things in our thinking right from the uh, start of this uh, program, in as much as we wanted this tool and technology to have longevity. So we wanted to contribute to the digital maturity of the system. So we wanted to help provide tools and technology, so equipment. So we worked with our local teams around building digital maturity around connectivity, the equipment used, etc. Um, and we also wanted the tool itself to have a long term impact. So we built into it an all cause deterioration tool called Restore 2, and in particular focused on Restore 2 Mini, which the carers would value in terms of communicating uh, soft signs of deterioration. Over time, we adopted uh, a, an agile approach to our work. Uh, this was a tried and tested um, organization that we'd worked with before, Safe Steps, um, but we needed to adapt the tool that we had used with them into a tool that would track COVID. So we, uh, we did a hackathon, we brought in users, both clinical and carers, we created personas to make sure that this would work for the people it was most meant to affect and we built a minimum viable product, which we were then able to test very quickly and then roll out at scale across all 10 of our localities, having tested it in one locality more deeply. That blueprint allowed us to uh, engage with uh, directors of commissioning, what would this cost in the future, to communicate with our DASs, which are our directors of adult and social care. So we were bridging gaps between health and social care, which was another aim and approach of uh, the, 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 the work that we were doing. Um, we wanted this to have system thinking. We wanted it to um, point out to us where there were variations in our approach, etc. And we also wanted to uh, look more deeply at the qualitative and quantitative impact of using digital technology like this in this setting. Um, so the technology itself is a URL based um, uh, a tool that will sit on any smartphone, iPad or tablet and uh, is very simple for the carer to use at the side of the bed and is expected to be used two to three times a week minimum, but we found that most of the end users used it on a daily basis. It improves the, uh, the dashboard ability of, of the receiving clinicians to be able to respond to uh, care needs within that care home. And let me just share some of the, uh, the, the data and the measures that we got. As you can see, we, um, we, we managed to, um, to roll this out to 151 care homes. That was the last data point we took, although that's going up on a daily basis. We've done almost uh, uh, 3, 369,000 assessments of residents in care, and that's to over 4,200 residents themselves across Greater Manchester. We've now set the, um, the tool up and it's, it's licensed for a further year and we continue to develop uh, adopt and spread methodology to try lift the blueprint that we created early in the uh, programme into common use across the entire system itself. We have um, some of the key learnings I think that we, we have are around the, the, the technology is, is great, but unless you train uh, the individuals, the carers at the bedside and the um, clinicians receiving this data, uh, that's where the real uh, secret source is, 
is created. Um, many thanks and, uh, uh, and look forward to uh, questions. Thanks, Jay. And do remember to pop your questions in the chat um, as we go. Uh, and now to the southeast, we've got Mark Needham. Mark is the Digital First Director and joined by Georgina Walton, who's a Senior Project Manager. Their work, they're going to tell us about their work with digital remote monitoring in care homes and community health. Another great example of partnership working across health and social care. Mark and Georgina. Thank you, Breed. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we'd like to tell you about digital remote monitoring in Kent and Medway. I'm Mark Needham from Health. And I'm Georgina Walton from Social Care. Our aims. In March 2020, we recognised there was an immediate need to move to digital pathways in primary care due to the pandemic. After the impact of Wave 1, we decided to build a digital bridge to care homes because the homes were cut off. And also during the winter, we used digital remote monitoring to support COVID patients and monitor their, their oxygen levels. So what were the key elements of this project? Getting the foundations right was essential, and we had to ensure that we had a confident and competent digital literate workforce, care sector workforce, that could embrace a range of technologies, including digital remote monitoring. We approached this through a range of activities which included training on Microsoft Teams to enable video consultations, NHS mail training to ensure the secure exchange of information, and introduced video care phones from social care, which was reduced, in, introduced during the pandemic to reduce social isolation and connect family with um, people with family and friends. We also distributed 550 um, iPads and delivered training on how to use these devices effectively, including a range of apps so that care workers could utilise the apps such as Help to Care, which was introduced in Kent and Medway for people that provided care and contains fundamental care elements to keep people well and out of hospital. We also connected 205 GP practices with 400 care homes. Thank you, Gina. What was our approach to digital remote monitoring and technology? In December, we procured a digital communication system with 5,000 oximeters and 5,000 digital licenses. By providing apps for patients at home and care home staff, they could send their oxygen saturation levels, which could be monitored remotely by our clinical teams. Since then, we've now put, we are now putting in place monitoring for 5,000 care home beds. We're extending the digital monitoring of a range of vital signs, including blood pressure, temperature, weight and pulse. Digital remote monitoring has allowed us to be preventative and also to start doing monthly health checks. Di digital remote monitoring also allows us to prevent deterioration and monitor more intensively patients outside of hospital. We would now like to talk to you a little bit about the outcomes and impacts of our work. So what has been our key learning? It's really important for the health and social care partnership to work collaboratively and gain the trust with the care sector and engage and work closely with the care sector to understand the challenges that the care sector is experiencing. When we started our project, we understood that there was wide variation in digital literacy and infrastructure within care homes. We spent time understanding this situation to understand what support the care sector needed and to inform our project plan. This enabled us to build the foundations to embrace digital remote monitoring and other technologies. Once we built the confidence with the care sector workforce and built the relationships, we started to win the clinical hearts and minds to embrace new technologies such as digital remote monitoring. This was supported through sharing case studies and insights from the people involved and demonstrated the impact of this work. This work has now informed our future digital roadmap and has informed the development of digital leadership roles such as clinical safety officer, digital nurses and care home facilitators. Thank you, Gina. And we'd also like to share a little bit about the impact that this has had for our patients and our system. Building on the confidence of staff, we've managed to monitor 6,000 patients remotely. 
of these, a thousand patients have received digital remote monitoring. A very small proportion have been escalated to A&E or the emergency department, which suggests that we've prevented a deterioration of patients, but also helped them get support from hospital when needed. We're really only beginning to understand the use case of digital remote monitoring, the benefits of clinical decision making and the opportunities for providing more proactive care for patients. The national team believe, as do we, from the evidence we've seen so far, that this has saved lives. Thanks, Mark and Georgina. Our last presentation for this part of the session, and we're off to London, where Dr Shani Gray, a GP and clinical lead for remote monitoring in care homes, tells their story of making a difference for care home residents and health and care staff. Shani, over to you. Thank you, Breed, and good afternoon, everyone. So it's really great to be able to speak to you today a bit about the Remote Monitoring in Care Homes project that we're doing in North Central London using WASAM. Um, so just to speak a little bit about the kind of the aim of this project and what we're wanting to do with it, um, so we're looking at introducing remote monitoring to over 100 care homes across five boroughs in north central London. And I think really at the heart of this, you know, it's around improving the quality of care that we provide to care home residents. So this covers people who are in nursing homes, but also residential care homes and learning disability homes as well. And what we know about that is looking at things like the enhanced health and care homes framework. So this was an NHS England document which came out which really looked at what are the learnings, what are the things that we know that improve the quality of care for those in care homes. Um, there were some really key things that came out around kind of enhanced primary care support, the ability to work in kind of multidisciplinary teams, and really quite good use of data and IT and technology. Um, and I think, you know, doing remote monitoring, it really seems like it's a project that very much kind of hits a lot of those domains. So if I just speak a little bit about WISAM, um, so this is a picture of the WISAM blue box and this has, you know, a pulse oximeter in there so you can get patients oxygen levels, pulse, you can also check their blood pressure and their temperature and that all kind of comes together on this tablet which the care home staff kind of have in this box and then there is a portal which can be accessed by clinicians, so for example GPs, but we've also got lots of sort of nurses or community matrons who work with some of our care homes in North Central London. And they can look and have at that patient data, which really kind of helps to inform decision making in terms of, you know, when staff are worried about somebody being unwell. But it also allows for remote working, which we know in the pandemic has been really, really quite necessary. Um, our approach to kind of how we've looked to implement and embed it. Um, so we very much wanted to work with the willing. And I think that's quite important whenever we are trying something new. So we look to get expressions of interest from care homes who are really keen to get going from this and also expressions of interest from GP practices and really look to trying to kind of match those up um, and then take that forward from there to kind of see which homes we worked with. And I think in terms of stakeholder engagement, which is so important, we've taken sort of multiple strategies in terms of the team I'm working with. So we've got a team of nurse educators who work with the care homes and myself and a whole project team. And I think it's been really key that the kind of the stakeholder engagement is ongoing and whether that is written information, webinars, local forums, um, and really using a lot of the existing relationships that we already had in the system working with care homes um, to kind of, you know, as the foundations for getting this going. What we found and in terms of some of the improvement principles we've used, um, certainly, we've done quite regular sort of PDSA cycles as we're implementing this. So even a simple thing like, you know, how do we induct a care home in a GP practice? Constantly trying new ideas, often even on a weekly basis around, you know, how we train people up. Do we do it in person? Do we do it remotely? Do we have a video for people? What feedback do we get? What do we learn from this to quite, you know, keep improving on the process and fine tuning it the whole time? And I would say some of the key learnings from this have very much been around, I think, GP engagements at the heart of it. And that needs to be a kind of an ongoing process to get people on board and on side. Certainly, it's perceived as most beneficial in care homes where this is adding something new. So particularly in our learning disability homes and in our residential care homes who weren't doing observations for patients before, this has really, really added something. Um, whereas for our nursing homes who were doing this sort of prior to now, 
it maybe adds something less so. So thinking about your environment and your setting. And I think there is a real opportunity with this is what we've found is that, you know, you can add a lot more in terms of picking up other needs in the home and then actually taking those forward. So that might be training needs on how staff actually escalate when somebody's unwell. In terms of how we're evaluating this, so this is being led by the Health Innovation Network and we're looking at a whole range of patient outcomes. So we've got a number listed here, particularly around things like falls, UTIs, minor head injuries, some of the really common things that people get sort of brought into hospital for. We're also going to be getting qualitative feedback from a range of clinicians, residents and staff. Um, where we're at at the moment, so we've got 60 care homes who have implemented this and are using this. And we've had a range of really positive feedback and I'll sort of leave you with this quote to look through, which comes from one of our carers working in a disability home, um, showing you know, how useful they found it and it really improves staff confidence um, and their feeling that they're kind of right in their thinking and they can communicate with commissions. So thank you for your time and I'll hand back to you, Breed. Thank you, Shani. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed those first four presentations. Um, and now we're going to go to our panel Q&A. Um, there is one question in the chat about an ISO standard, which uh, I think Chris has responded to because it, there's a, it's an international standard and, and we've obviously worked through the English, uh, in UK requirements. Do we have our panel? Fabulous. Uh, thank you, everybody. Really inspiring presentations. A couple of questions. Um, Ros, if I can come to you first. Obviously, inclusive digital transformation is such an important part of this. Um, you, you mentioned in your presentation a little bit about some resources. If I was starting to think about this, what would be your recommendations? Where would I start? Really so. Um, I guess there's a, a where would you start from a national level, from a regional and local level and from an individual level. And I think, um, you know, our recommendations from some of the work that we've done include a national level really to set some direction and get this into, into policy, into funding programmes and so on. And I know that NHSX this year actually put into the funding programmes a question around, you know, how are we going to make sure that, uh, that this digital transformation does not compound inequality? And I think that's a brilliant move and also in our national NHS England uh, implementation guidance digital exclusion digital inclusion has started to creep in so I think we've really you know started that so that would be my recommendation recommendation at a policy level um, at a local level I think it's really important to reach out to the partners and I think a number of um, uh, people today have talked about partnerships and it's so important across local government across the voluntary sector and particularly in partnership with people who we're talking about here because they're not the, the problem they're part of the solution and then finally just one little first step for everybody who's working in digital transformation is to stay, take an hour to just think through who might be excluded who actually might not get equal access to this and why and then after that you, you make a choice don't you you make a choice of whether to you know just carry on regardless or to actually do something about it so that's that's my top tips for you thank you Roz. very very good advice there i think um, can I next, if I can go to Jay, uh, Jay, um, great achievement in such a short space of time. Um, where would you like to see this going next? And you know, what could we do with QI to, to help that? Um, so where next? I guess um, we've built a platform on the basis of a crisis and I think everyone's um, aware of, uh, of that opportunity that was provided by such an awful situation. I think where we want to go next is sustainability of these um, digital and technological approaches to the way we manage uh, care in, in, in the settings that we're all talking about today. I think from a, a QI point, I'll pick up Ros's um, comments and I think something also that Shani said, and that's uh, the, the need to continually learn and not think that you've got the right solution straight away. It's absolutely appropriate and beneficial to continue that cycle of learning, to keep going back to the technology, the SOP that you've put into place, the standard operating procedure that you think is working, and keep checking in with the people who you're asking to use that technology, who you're uh, expecting to receive that remote monitoring experience and say, is this still working? Can we improve this? How do we make this better? Uh, and I think, you know, the the secret sauce, as I mentioned in in the presentation, is is that engagement with everyone 
everyone that's involved in the pathway of care. Uh, and I think that's that's really uh, what I'd like to see happen and continue to happen uh, going forward, Breed. Wonderful, thanks. Um, we've just got a question in the chat that says, and I'm just going to read it out so you can think about who'd like to come in on this. Uh, so I'll give you a moment. How do you mitigate against the risk of medicalising people in their, in their homes, their care home, who don't want it? Who undertakes the treatment escalation planning news, trigger, news to triggering? So if, we can, if people can ponder that and let me know who'd like to come in on that. But if I can go to Mark and George, I know Georgina is not on the call, Mark, but uh, it's a really great example of you presented together, you work in partnership, it's health and social care, it's where we all want to get to, real partnership working. What makes it work? Um, thank you. I think the, the joint problem, particularly during the pandemic, about how to provide health and care to care homes was a, a shared problem for the council and, and the NHS. Um, I think what makes it work with care homes and, and primary care networks and GPs uh, is showing that this has real tangible benefits for them. These are very resourced, uh, challenged areas of our health and care system. Um, and building on existing relationships, really, uh, making everything as simple, accessible uh, and doable as possible. Thank you. And, and Shani, I'm wondering if you'd like to pick up the medicalising question. Um, uh, as a medic, it, it might be something close to your heart. Absolutely. And I think this is something that we've had to do a lot of kind of soul searching around even locally because, you know, this is people in their homes and if they are in a care home, that is still their home. And I think it's really important to recognise that differentiation that they're not in hospital, that it is, it's a different setting. Um, and I think it is a balance. I think there's really something around, um, to fundamentally put it, using common sense. So for example, we're using News 2 with Wazan. There could be potentially a real risk with that that you're kind of seeing so much that falls into the kind of abnormal or escalation range, but you have to look at it in the context of the actual person and the individual. And I really, really see this as this is just supplementing with additional information, but it doesn't change how we make decisions. So for example, lots of people, particularly if they are older people in a care home, they should have an advanced care plan that should take into account that person's wishes their family's wishes, what the care home staff know about them, what the GP and all the other people. And I think it's really important with remote monitoring that that doesn't end up seeming as trumping that and that's medicalised and so, you know, you must call an ambulance or whatever. Sometimes, and we actually, when we developed locally our own kind of how we were going to use News 2, we looked at what were all the services we have in place to support people in the care home and we kind of put a big sort of caveat at the top saying, what is the context of this person's health? What's their advanced care plan? And actually, if somebody's deteriorating, it may be that actually that's enacting an end of life care plan rather than, you know, escalating somebody to hospital as being acutely unwell. So I think the context is absolutely critical and it's really important, I think, anywhere that's doing this to bear that in mind about, you know, it's supplemental information but use everything else you know about that person and who they are and what they want and what their health is like and their family's involvement. And then you can make actually really sensible, well-informed decisions, I think. Um, so yeah, you've got to look at the context of the person. Thanks, Shani. It is all about personalised care, isn't it? This is not about using something for the sake of using it. Um, we've just had another question about ha um, have we had to cover any of the software's medical device legislation in the deployed systems? That's a fairly generic question um, and we've got uh, lots of different uh, platforms and technical solutions being talked about in this um, presentation. Uh, all of our, all of our um, projects have gone through uh, consideration against MHRA. They, people have to do this as part of the uh, process that I think Chris Richmond has outlined in the earlier chat uh, around the DCB 0129 and 160, which is part of our clinical safety sign-off. So, um, Chris, perhaps you could pop up some links to MHRA in the chat for those who aren't from the UK. That might be helpful. Um, on that note, I'm just going to ask um, somebody who, uh, any, anybody, if they want to make any last comment, having heard of each other's presentations, actually, if there's anything that you'd really like to finish on. Um, 
I'll say something if that's okay, Breed. Um, and it's really to remember the digital trans digital is a tool. Um, and it's a means to an end, it's not the end. Um, and I think that's been really well explained by, by my colleagues today. Um, but also to remember that not everybody has equal access to digital or is easily able to access to digital. And those people are more likely to need health and care services. So when, when, we're, when we're developing digitally enabled health and care, we need to co-design in partnership with those people and understand the context, understand what matters to them, their context, and what might get in the way, and make sure that they, they have um, you know, continued equal access to the health and care services that they need. Thanks, Roz. And that actually reminds me, there was a question earlier in the chat about are these technology projects. I, don't, I think this is not about technology or about QI. It's about both side by side working in partnership. This is really about our common sense of purpose to improve care for our patients and to give support people at home who want to be supported. Coming back to the previous question, it's about what's right for that patient. So on that note, I'm going to say thank you to our four presenters and panelists. Um, fabulous session and uh, yes we will move on to the part two of our um, presentations so on this um, our next speakers this the focus of this second part is uh, our COVID virtual wards or COVID oximetry at home uh, uh, projects that I talked about earlier and we will finish on a mental health um, project um, so we're going to start in the southwest of England and I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Hein LaRue, a GP and clinical lead for this, and Megan Isaac, who's the senior project manager, to share their story of a primary care-led COVID oximetry at home service. Uh, over to you. Thanks very much, Breed. Uh, hello, everybody. We are here today to present on the quality improvement processes and outcomes seen from our digitally enabled COVID virtual ward in Gloucestershire. Uh, my name is Megan Isaac, I'm the lead programme manager on COVID and respiratory programmes for Gloucestershire and I'm presenting today with my colleague uh, Dr Hein Le Roo, who's one of our extremely valuable GP clinical leads. Thanks Megan. The overall aim of the COVID virtual ward was to monitor the at-risk patient cohort in their own homes to identify early signs of deterioration with silent hypoxia so we could escalate their care to hospital whilst also ensuring the remaining patients felt safe during their illness. The approach to developing a COVID virtual ward was initially undertaken within a testing environment using three PDSA cycles which we commenced using CCG staff and then built upon with well patients in collaboration with the Willing Primary Care Network. We worked with an incumbent telehealth provider called Baywater, who provided the test patients with a pulse oximeter and a digital tablet to record their readings throughout the day. We established a multidisciplinary project team who met on a daily basis to assess real-time feedback from the PDSAs and utilise this alongside immersion national guidance to construct a pathway that we could embed locally. Key themes taken from the PDSAs in regards to the clinical pathway and the technological need included the need for a seven-day service, our patient inclusion criteria, the need for engagement and education across the system as we identified the importance of all stakeholders needing to be brought into the vision for the service we were trying to deliver, a two-way communication platform with patients, clear alert parameters that could be tailored for patients with underlying health conditions, options for patients to submit their readings via other means than a smart device as we were keen not to allow for any digital exclusion, and adaptability in line with the evolving model in response to ongoing assessment and evaluation in real time. Following a phased rollout by PCNs across the county, the team continued to meet regularly to assess the journeys of the patients referred so far. This responsive continual improvement approach allowed us to amend and improve processes as we went along. Examples of such areas are improved refer referral pathways and additional training for care, nursing and supported living facilities direct referral pathways from some secondary care specialties, increased comms and engagement with primary care to increase overall referral rates and adapted onboarding processes. We adopted four uh, main improvement principles. So first, as Megan's already set out, the cornerstone of our successful innovation was the use of model for improvement using rapid PDSA cycles. Second, we use measurement for improvement principles to help us identify and manage our patient safety risks we had clear outcome, process and balancing measures. 
Third, we used the Pareto chart principle to understand which patient cohorts were at most risk of deteriorating with silent hypoxia, and thus where we needed to target our efforts to have greatest impact. Finally, using stakeholder analysis, we identified that our 72 GP practices were very important to engage with, which resulted in such a high number of patients being referred to the ward. Uh, our key learning has identified four overarching themes. So first, we defined our aim as uh, silent hypoxia in risk, at risk groups, and we work backwards to achieve this. Second, uh, having a continuous improvement mindset and approach, we were able to rapidly adapt our model as new challenges and gaps came to light. Third, we were very responsive to feedback, which helped us get early sight of potential safety challenges. And finally, we set up a dashboard early on, so we uh, could have oversight of the procedures, and this allowed everyone to focus their efforts on exceptions and also gave everyone transparency of the whole process, as well as all the interdependencies. Thanks, Simon. So here on, a, um, on this slide, um, the main graph is showing the number of referrals to the COVID virtual ward between November and April. Uh, this metric was our main key success factor, and we've seen over 1,240 patients um, so far. Uh, alongside overall referrals, we also tracked patient safety scrupulously, which we could gauge based on the proportion of patients entering their readings twice daily as instructed. If they missed a reading, they would alert on the system, which then prompted a call from Baywater to make sure that they were okay. We took many actions to reduce this number of refer this number of alerts, sorry, and we found that reducing the referral to the patient entering their first reading meant that the patient was more likely to stay compliant with the process for the full two weeks of monitoring. We also managed measured the level of referrals to secondary care, which in this instance showed that the more referrals that were made meant that the ward was doing what it was designed to do identifying those that needed escalation and doing so in times for the patient's lives to be saved. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Hein and Megan. And now to the Midlands. Uh, and again, delighted to welcome Zoe Harris. Zoe is, Zoe is the Integrated Cardiorespiratory Clinical Lead and is joined by Alex Woodward, the Deputy Cardiorespiratory Lead. And they're telling us about their community-led COVID virtual ward. Over to you. Thank you, Breed. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, we're delighted to be here from the East Midlands to talk to you about digital pathways for the management of cardiorespiratory conditions and COVID-19. So the aims of the project were at the beginning of the pandemic, we developed two new digital pathways for COPD and heart failure patients. This was important as we wanted to provide an effective service for our patients whilst reducing face-to-face -face contact and thus protecting the clinical vulnerable. We needed to be able to identify when individual patients' condition was deteriorating and intervene early to provide treatment and support to reduce the risk of hospital admission. In response to the needs of the local healthcare system, we commenced a COVID virtual ward in the autumn of 2020, and our fourth care pathway was developed um, in response to a virtual rehab program for people with cardiorespiratory conditions so they could complete um, exercise and education safely in their own homes. So our approach was that patients told us they wanted to receive care. However, they were reluctant for us to provide that on a face-to-face -face basis. Um, as this was a new way to deliver clinical care, it was very important to engage our frontline clinicians and digital champions became their voice. We developed clinical standard operating procedures and were able to progress robust and good governance across organisations quickly. Briefly about the technology, um, patients um, access a web-based portal to submit their data. Um, they were also given vital signs monitoring equipment and also completed um, symptom-based questions. The information submitted was then available on a central clinician dashboard, which enabled the team to prioritise clinical interventions. To describe the improvement principles, we have been delivering digital pathways for over one year. We wanted to understand from our patients um, their experience of, of using a digital pathway. So we have completed patient experience questionnaires. 
We have also led a quality improvement project and the learning will be used to enhance pathways of care going forward. Similarly, we have continually enhanced the pathways from a clinical perspective using plan, do, study, act methodology. This was important clinically and enhanced staff engagement. They were asked to feedback their real-time experience in a you said we did process which worked well with the team. So in terms of key learning, clinician engagement is key. We had to act quickly in terms of um, developing and delivering new key new clinical pathways. Continuous improvement process um, through plan, do, study, act. Stakeholder communication and trust um, we have built over the last year and that will inform our care pathways going forward. We have invested in clinician training and education and we are passionate about patient engagement for ongoing development. In terms of next steps, that is development of a system virtual ward, not, over, not only for COVID-19, but for heart failure, COPD, and possibly asthma and other care pathways as the, as the virtual ward develops. I'm now going to hand over to Alex. We wanted to give you a very brief overview of the impact our digital work has had for our patients and also the wider healthcare system locally. Since we rapidly expanded our digital offer back in March of 2020, we've been able to care for over a thousand patients via our four digital pathways, all of which have received some really excellent and positive feedback from our patients. In terms of improvement, we've really been able to have a quite a big impact on the readmission rate for 19 patients locally. The average readmission rate from our acute hospitals locally for COVID-19 patients is around 9%. However, in our COVID-19 cohort that went through our virtual ward, this was reduced to 4.6%, which shows there's been nearly a 50% reduction in readmissions in our patients. The biggest impact our digital work has had is in the oxygen weaning cohort as part of our COVID-19 virtual ward. Back in January of this year, we expanded our COVID virtual ward to include patients on weaning doses of oxygen. Prior to this, these patients would have had to stay in an acute hospital bed until their oxygen was weaned off before they could go home. Between January and the end of April this year, we had 27 patients referred to our virtual ward for oxygen weaning. Uh, three of these patients we weren't able to wean off uh, due to underlying medical conditions. In the, well, the bar chart um, on the slide shows for the 24 patients that we were able to wean off oxygen, it shows the number of days it took per patient to get them off the oxygen. And as you can see, there's a real range of how long this took from a few days up to a, a few weeks. But overall, nearly half of the cohort were actually on the virtual ward for more than 10 days. Overall, we've been able to save 288 acute hospital bed days, which has obviously had a real significant impact for our local healthcare economy in terms of bed days saved and hospital and ward capacity. But it's had a real significant positive impact for our patients. They've been able to go home sooner, be with their families much sooner rather than staying in an acute hospital bed until their oxygen was weaned off. And we'd just really like to say thank you for this opportunity to uh, present our work. Thanks Zoe and Alex. And now to the site of our first acute-led virtual ward, um, and that's in the east of England. Uh, we have Dr Andy Barlow. Andy is a consultant respiratory physician and divisional director for medicine at West Hertfordshire NHS Trust. Over to you Andy. Thank you, Breed, and good afternoon, everybody. On behalf of a, a large and very significant team, I'm delighted to be able to present um, how we went about developing a new evidence-based prognostication tool to aid decision-making into an in innovative new virtual ward or platform to look after patients um, with acute COVID infection. The aim of this project was to deliver an evidence-based integrated virtual hospital supported and driven by a new prognostication tool 
in order that we uh, put the right patients in the right place in their care pathway with this novel disease entity, uh, acute COVID. Secondary uh, goal was to protect our hospital from being overwhelmed. Um, and being as it is a very challenged estate and one of the oldest hospitals in the country with a low acute bed to population ratio. Finally, we were minded to identify likely senior skilled decision makers who would not be able to participate in standard face-to-face -face clinical intervention during uh, the acute COVID crisis, but to properly utilize and recognize their skills um, in this new, new virtual hospital. The improvement principles and the goals of the project were, to, were first and foremost to, uh, to drive down uh, as far as possible mortal mortality rates with patients with COVID. With regard to the new virtual hospital, we, we wanted to identify and deliver low readmission rates. We saw readmission rates as a surrogate for the quality of the decision making at the front door. Finally, we were interested and, and very focused on patient satisfaction um, uh, in this new process. So how did, we, how did we go about this? The first step was to design a new virtual pathway. This was a seven days a week, 14 day hospital pathway, effectively where senior clinic, clinicians delivered ward, ward rounds in the virtual domain. Initially, this was supported by pulse oximetry, but as, as in later iterations of the cycle um, in, uh, of ad adaptation, um, we folded in a new web-based uh, monitoring program provided by uh, humor called Medipad. This enabled patients to interact with clinicians, um, provide and upload physiologic data uh, and symptom profiling and offline for clinicians and patients to interact together. Uh, in order to commence the pathway, uh, we designed a, uh, a first, first cut of what the clinical pathway should look like and the entry criteria were designed based on data that came out of Northern Italy and China. However, we were very minded to identify a prognostication tool that was suitable for our population. And during the first wave, uh, with a very large team of junior doctors, we organized and accrued data on all our acute COVID patients. And that led to the publication in Thorax of this year of the, score, of the SOARS scoring system. And this to date is still the first front door scoring system designed to, for decision making in the emergency department which is not reliant on any sophisticated investigation or test result um, and so um, where we we, uh, we ran the pathway with this new scoring system from the end of wave one and through wave two our key learning um, was that this this was a safe and effective method to manage patients in the acute setting and we're in an advanced um, advanced setting to develop and deliver new COPD and heart failure virtual hospitals, which are integrated with community teams and stakeholders in, in our locality. Key to any um, new intervention um, is to ensure that the governance and the safety of the program um, is robust. And to date, we're, the own, uh, we're one of the few virtual hospitals in the UK to publish our data um, and, and subject it to, to the scrutiny of peer review. The first 900 patients' uh, results were published in the BMJ Open and the references provided here. Well, the table on the right-hand side actually shows the full Wave 1 and Wave 2 data set. Um, and it, I'd like to draw your attention to a number of things. Firstly, the overall mortality rates were very low and actually dropped in Wave 2. And secondly, that our readmission rate from the virtual hospital again was low and fell significantly in the, in the second data set. And in doing so, we've, de we've demonstrated that, um, that we've delivered on our initial intentions to provide a safe virtual platform, um, but also uh, uh, ensuring that the quality of the care has been very high. In relation to patient feedback, we, um, we were one of the five trusts to provide data for Naomi Phillips uh, review of acute COVID hospitals in uh, late 2020. Um, and we continue to update our, uh, upload our data to the national survey. Um, there's a link uh, provided uh, here, which also shows what, what one patient's particular views were in terms of her experience of the virtual hospital. And this was a subject of a, night, a, a national news 
article which we were delighted to collaborate with. Can you make it to the top without stopping? If I go very, very slowly, yes. Okay. We know things have changed, including hospital consultations, but this one is different still. Natasha, who had coronavirus, was given a device to monitor her own oxygen levels at home. It has been nice from the perspective of I can be in my own home comforts, with my own home comforts, and be able to monitor things and know that someone else is monitoring it. I can almost guarantee that if something's not okay, someone will ring me quite soon. <laughs> um, and, and finally, we, we were also delighted to be name checked by the BMJ as one of the first virtual ho virtual hospitals to open in the country. So in summary, this is um, this is an example of a new and innovative virtual platform. The key to the success of this is evidence-based decision-making, effective monitoring, clear escalation routes, and, and most importantly, most uh, robust governance frameworks where, where departments and institutions subject their results to, uh, to peer scrutiny. We believe this is a safe and effective method for managing other acute clinical pathways such as COPD and heart failure. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. And now, last but definitely not least, uh, we're off to the northeastern Yorkshire. We've got Dr. Manny Krishnan, a consultant psychiatrist, and Lauren Bennett, an innovation coordinator. And they're going to tell us about the use of technology to enable them to continue to provide safe care for patients needing antipsychotic medication during um, COVID. Over to you. Thank you, Breed. Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to share our experience uh, from the Northeast and Yorkshire on one of our innovative TIS remote ECG project. The project was about use of a remote ECG monitoring device uh, called a live core six lead ECG device. And this device, we used it as a project uh, in our trust for uh, monitoring patients who are on antipsychotic medication and also initiating patients on antipsychotic medication. The reason for this project uh, to take off is the pandemic. During the pandemic, as we all know, routine investigations have been stalled or postponed, and then some of our patients uh, were not able to access ECG. And at that time, we found this innovative device that could be used remotely using Bluetooth technology. Uh, and uh, we thought we will try to look at this as a usability. And what we did as an improvement methodology, we did a, we used the PDSA cycle. We planned how we want to uh, implement this project uh, and then uh, incidentally, because it was a COVID pandemic, we were able to get some engagement from our trust senior leadership uh, to get a go ahead to try it out. And then while we were doing this, we thought we will get a real world evaluation of how the benefit of this uh, using this device was. Uh, and so we started with the um, implementation of the project with 30 devices as a pilot project. And then we also did a real world evaluation on uh, what are the benefits of it. Uh, we used the device uh, in the community, you know, taken by our uh, nurses and support workers. And then we asked the patients uh, about what do they think uh, about the benefit of uh, using this device? And uh, as you can see from the graph, uh, patients really loved it. Uh, they thought it is easy. Uh, it, uh, it, you know, it was quite useful for their, you know, dignity and privacy. It was very quick. And then they thought this will be the future preferred method of uh, uh, ECG recording they would like. Uh, and then again, uh, you could see some of the staff feedback that staff felt that it was really useful. Uh, and they also thought that, um, uh, uh, you know, the amount of ECGs you can do in a short period of time is really quick. And in fact, one of our staff members said, if you take it off me, I will cry. Uh, and uh, also on a kind of a quick economic uh, kind of analysis we did was this actually improved time to care, uh, time to care by the nurses to uh, the patient, uh, because we could save around 17.5 minutes 
between the conventional ECG and this new ECG, which is the time the staff could provide to care for this uh, patient and also provide psychological input. So just to, uh, you know, the things we learned uh, from this improvement project is that we had few kind of initial kind of concerns. People were worried, is it effective, the quality of the ECG? Uh, I must admit the quality of the ECG, you get this from the tiny device you can see on the picture is amazing uh, the, compared to the conventional ECG. And the key learnings are change can be scary, uh, but the global pandemic made us that it is necessary to embrace change. and we needed a group of multidisciplinary staff to support us with the project uh, and also uh, supporting, facilitating training for everyone and then starting to upscale the project and share and spread way for everyone to take it is really important. So I do think that with this project that we were able to break some of the barriers during the pandemic you know, if it was pre-COVID, probably I don't think we would have very quickly scaled it up. We were able to plan, do, study, and then act and upscale in a very quick way. And we need to learn this in the future so that this kind of innovation is embraced across the um, global healthcare. Thank you. Thanks, Krish. Um, hopefully, uh, and thanks to all our um, uh, speakers, and hopefully you're just about to join us on the panel. Um, uh, inspiring stories, uh, as always. Um, and I'm delighted to say with the, the project that Krish has just spoken to, actually people around the country are looking to um, scale and, and um, learn and, and uh, from what Krish and team have done. You'll have noticed that Lauren didn't join us, but she was very pivotal to the project, so important to acknowledge. Um, so we've got a couple of questions. There's one comment from Penny in the chat that I think would be great to have other people contribute to, which is actually, you know, QI and technology working in partnership is surely the way forward. But actually from the people listening, what are your views? What's happening where you're working? You know, have you got anything to share in terms of how we can capitalize on that opportunity or even any challenges? So do pop things in the chat. Um, and I'm going to go first uh, to um, Andy. Andy, as a clinician, uh, you've embraced uh, what digital offers um, in a big way uh, to help you manage your patients. And you've, you know, the emerging peer-reviewed evidence is, is really impressive. Where do you see this going next? What's your, where do you think the other opportunities are? Thank you. Um, like others, other speakers earlier on, I think the the opportunity is huge to evolve this into other care pathways, and it provides an opportunity to break down the traditional bricks and mortar. Um, people think about hospital care, community care, and I, th I, th I think increasingly that's going to be a meaningless description as we move into uh, increasing to the virtual age. So um, I, I see nothing but opportunity uh, with integrated care pathways um, cutting into uh, those traditional traditional healthcare uh, descriptions, uh, but keeping the patient always at the centre of, of of care, and I totally embrace the uh, uh, comments from another speaker earlier on who who said that you know digital technology is fantastic, but it 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 it, it's, it's, it can't be a tail that wags the dog, and ultimately uh, it's it's a means to ensuring patient safety and high quality care. But we can't be too focused on that. It has to be patient-focused care. Thank you, absolutely. This is about personalised care and what's right for the patient and staff as well, of course. Um, and Megan, if I can come to you. Uh, very different uh, project because you're working in primary care. It's a primary care-led service. That's quite different to a hospital where people are all together. You've got a very distributed GP uh, base, but you've managed to do this and use QI. Any particular challenges or tips for people on doing that? no mean feat. No, absolutely. I think one of the, the biggest challenges we had was around engagement um, for primary care, you know, the, the pressures that they've had um, over the last 18 months have been significant, no more than any other sector, obviously, but um, engaging GPs with very different um, priorities, personalities um, was, was no mean feat, as you say. So I think 
persistence is key. Um, we tried various different angles to um, to get in touch with them um, and and to get a message across them that really resonated. Um, so I think I think that was without them and and their their input, we wouldn't have um, been able to. Um, support as many patients as we did because our GPs were um, integral in the case finding element of our service so um, without their input then the patients wouldn't have been referred in the first place but um, yeah I think we understood the importance of that really early on and it was very key in our project plan um, as to how we were going to approach that and I think we did with gusto um, and it obviously paid off in the uh, in the long term. Yes, absolutely. It was a real snowball effect because I remember meeting one of your GP colleagues early on and he spoke with such passion about the opportunity and then your PDSA cycles and it just grew and grew, it seemed. So well done. Um, uh, um, so Andy, coming to you in community, um, and I realise a few people haven't been able to join the panel, so acknowledgements to Hein and Zoe. Um, and are you, um, again, impressive bed day savings for you, which obviously the other Andy also had. Um, but, you know, from a community perspective and your oxygen weaning, do you want to say anything more about where you think the opportunities lie? I would really echo what um, Andy said about developing out into other care pathways. We're currently looking at adapting our model for respiratory patients for this winter and then longer term looking at um, cardiac and heart failure patients as well. I think it's really helped to really break down some barriers with not only for patients and their beliefs in digital pathways, but also our clinicians and also our colleagues in the acute sector as well, that virtual wards are really effective, but mainly they're really safe as well. Um, all the projects that have been talked about this afternoon have all said we're going to have safe the patients have been there's been very few adverse events reported from any of them nationally, really. But just to pick up on something um, linked to the QI work that you mentioned, Breed, um, we've done a piece with our patients that have been through all the different digital pathways that we've been running. And we have found that patients have really engaged and liked the digital, but it's when it gets to the end and they're discharged, they often ask, well, what do I do now? where do I go next? Because they've had su that such intense support whilst they've been on the digital pathway that when they're either optimised or over their acute episode and it's taken away, they often then feel that kind of gap in their care. So I think that's something for people to consider in the design of their digital pathways about that kind of post-discharge care for our patients. That's a really interesting and important point, Andy, because actually if patients feel they're getting such intense support through a tech-enabled or remote monitoring pathway, that's a really positive thing. But I think it is, as you say, it's not a pathway that you stay on. It is what we've heard from everybody to date is that it's for a finite period of time. It's like we can't just think about it as a endless just because it's digital, because there's a workforce requirement behind it. So um, really interested to hear from any others on the panel what they think about that point, and then I'll come to Krish. What are patients that might need ongoing, or has anyone, have you had any experiences Andy has outlined? Can I come back in, Bree? We could hear you. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, I was just going to uh, uh, pick up a point that Alex made about um, there's something special about this enhanced uh, cover the patients receive on a digital platform that um, it may be over and above what they would have normally received in a standard care pathway, maybe where they started off in hospital and went home. Uh, and we, we saw a similar significant reduction in readmission rates uh, and Alex's, Alex's data was very impressive, showing um, showing how far below the national average of one in, uh, uh, national average of readmission uh, that were experienced with COVID, uh, which is about 30% at 90 days. So his data is very, very impressive. Um, and there's, it may well be that there's something about that, that increased attention to detail whilst they're on that platform, the, the virtual platform. Um, which enables clinicians to pick up 
new problems that weren't previously there and to identify anxieties and issues and, and avert and allay, allay concerns at that stage rather than allow, allow them to grow. And I think that's one of our interesting opportunities here, isn't it? As a longer term study, what are the outcomes? Because we can't tell uh, just now, but we have seen some um, early evidence from work in the northeast again where patients on a self-monitoring INR pathway who take warfarin, that actually they're staying in therapeutic levels more because they're self-managing and being uh, perhaps more responsible. So there's, I think there's going to be really interesting findings in, in due course, but we need some time for some of those larger outcomes. Krish, coming to you. Um, you have had fabulous staff and patient feedback. Um, and we know that uh, we've, had an, we've got an appetite for this across the country now. What's your advice to people from England, outside of England, you know, that might be thinking about doing something similar and they're just starting out? I think as we all, the colleagues have explained about uh, how quality improvement comes to real life, it's the patient care, the passion to care, passion to improve, passion to embrace digital technology are the key in getting from what we read to coming back to the practicality. This tiny device, I've been watching more than a year, even before the COVID, how to use it. But I was using that opportunity when FDA gave an emergency authorization on 23rd of March last year. And now, year on, we have done 741 ECGs, first time in the world. We couldn't have done it without that improvement methodology. But we had COVID as an enabler so even though we had a terrible pandemic, we used that to our advantage to break barriers. So when you have a passion, when you have a curiosity, always use your networks and your support to get that better thing for the patient. So there will be barriers, but there is always ways to overcome. Just to let you know, today we had all our clinical safety case, everything was approved just around an hour ago. So it'll be ready to roll out even wider in the trust. I couldn't have done it without the support of our HSN, NHSX, but the passion to do the right thing for the patients. Chris, very powerful words. And actually, it's reflective. You talk about your networks. Great keynote speech this morning with uh, Hugh and Vlad, worth the watch in terms of networks and the power of people. Um, and I think a couple of other sessions that link cause, uh, to some of this, 7.30 this morning, Penny and others talked about some of their work in COVID and digital, really powerful stuff from um, uh, the UK and Nigeria. So there's lots. I've been really delighted to see how much digital and QI are starting to merge in this particular forum. And I think COVID has been a real catalyst for that. We now come to the end of our session. So thanks to, to all our presenters and a special thanks to my colleague Donna who has done lots of work in the background to support us all and to Martin who's been fabulous with technical support. Um, we would like to invite anyone who's interested in more, hearing more to join us. Donna's put some things in the chat around uh, an event we're having on the 24th of May. So please do join us if you'd like to hear more. And remember I said at the beginning, this is the start of a conversation. So please connect social media, people have put their comments or their contact details in the chat. We want to keep the conversation going because I believe QI and digital together will just be such a powerful force as long as we always have the patient at the centre. So on that, thank you all and have a lovely weekend. <laughs>